Amen. How are you guys doing today? Good. It's nice to see you. 8.30 a.m. bright and early, ready to rock and roll. I am so excited. I don't know, man. There's just something in my heart today that is just bursting with joy. It was even like singing that last song, you know? I mean, it's, it's this moment when life is over. And I was thinking, like, why am I smiling? You know what I mean? Like, why, why am I happy with that? And then I thought, I'm like, man, isn't that what it's all about? It's living this life, the breath that we have in our lungs every single day for the glory of God so that one day we'll be reunited with him. It's going to happen. It's the one common denominator for each and every single one of us. Of course, we should rejoice in that and realize that as long as we're here, as long as we're on this earth, we're going to make a difference. Amen. We're going to live for God, and we're going to love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we're going to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That's why we're here. That's why we're breathing breath. And that's what we're learning, really, over the course of this summer. We're learning how to survive, and not just survive, but how to thrive. And I want to encourage you. Some of you, you're on uh, Facebook. You can pull out your phone if you want, because we are actually streaming live right now. And if you want to invite all your Facebook friends to come to church and make them sit in the front row, you can do that just by clicking that little share button. So feel free to go ahead and do that. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at things necessary for survival. We started week one with uh, Rick, who Rick got up here and he shared with us about water and the importance of water. Last week, we shared about the spark, being able to find a spark and what that can do. And today, we just want to continue that message. But before I get to that, I want to ask you a question. And I'm going to let you answer the question. And the question is simply this. Have you ever been lost in the wild? And if so, if you have been lost in the wild, how did that make you feel? Has anyone been lost in the wild? All right, I got someone here. How did that make you feel? I was scared out of my mind. I yelled and yelled and nobody heard me. All right, so scared, yelled and yelled, nobody heard me. Good, who else? Who else been lost in the wild? Okay. Look at all you, lack of an adventure. All right, right here, lost in the wild. How did it make you feel? Oh, okay. Yeah. So then you have someone and you start thinking, how far are they going to be able to go? And that responsibility comes back on you like, man, this is my fault. I shouldn't have brought my father-in-law out here. And, you know, for some people, they're really worried if their father-in-law brings them out there. They're kind of thinking to themselves, what did I do wrong? Right? What did I do wrong? Well, I think about it. I've been lost a couple times in my life, but there, there's one time that really sticks out for me. And it happened when I was young. I was probably about 10 or 11 years old at the time. And and for me, I grew up in Ohio. It was outside of Cleveland. And for me, I actually grew up in the country. Uh, my parents had about an acre of land, and then there were fields all around me. And oftentimes, they would change the crop in the fields, and there'd be soybeans there sometimes. And I remember this, this one summer, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, they had planted corn. And they planted corn in the fields behind me and, and the next field over, too. And I had my buddy with me. He was a couple years younger. And we decided that we were going to go on a hike through the cornfield, which is really fun when you start. All right. Corn is planted in rows. And as long as you stay in the rows, you're good and you keep going. But, you know, if you're 10, 11 years old, you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm going to go to the next row. And we started playing like tag and like hide and seek and I'm cutting into row and row. And, and, and before you know it, like, like we're going quite a distance and we keep walking, but now we're playing in the midst of the field. And, and there was another cornfield behind that cornfield and we kind of crossed the tree line into the other cornfield. And before you know it, quite a bit of time has passed. And I look at my buddy and I said, okay, which, which way is back home? And he said, that way. And I said that way, and I knew we were in trouble because neither one of us knew the way home. Now, I was in this moment, I said, okay, we got this, we got this. And we just started hiking and just started walking through. And now we're cutting through. If you don't stay in the row in the corn, you're getting cut up and you're getting hit. Things are hitting you in your face. You know, I mean, this corn is about six foot tall. And I, I'm a little, I'm a little 10 year old guy. You know, I mean, I, I can't bear, I cannot even see over this stuff. So I'm cutting through. And finally, we, we find a break in the corn and it breaks out onto the street. But then I look at the street and I have 
no idea what street this is. I know it's not my street though, so I turn around and go back in the cornfield, right? I said, I know that ain't home, so I just went back in. It was in this moment that I realized I was lost. And this is the moment that my heart started to beat. You know, that moment you realize I'm in trouble. And I started stressing out. And so, you know, the idea was, come on, come on, Chris. His name was Chris. Come on, Chris. And we just started running. Now we're running through the cornfield in the opposite direction of the street that we just ran into. And as we're running, it's cut me up and I'm getting, I'm starting to bleed and I'm trying to find it. I'm getting stressed. And then we get the great idea. Let's turn into Mega Man. So then I put Chris on my shoulders, right? And then he stood up. He can still barely see over this corn and he's looking around all he sees is corn. There's corn in every direction. And so he gets down and we just start running through the corn some more. And then I hear it very faintly. I hear my name. I I hear Greg, Greg. And I remember I, I knew the direction where I could hear it and I knew it was my name. And so I just took off in the direction of this voice that I could hear really faintly. And as I got closer to that voice, the voice got a little louder. I could hear it now, Greg, Greg. And then I recognized the voice. It was the voice of my mom. And then we kept running towards that. And then before I knew it, I heard Chris, Chris, Greg, Chris. And I could hear it was his mom. And so we just keep running. Now we're running just full, full bore. We don't care about anything corn. Cause I'd recently heard, you know, the story children of the corn and I'm worried I'm hearing Malachi is going to come out. Something bad's going to happen. You know, I, I'm just freaking out at this moment. I just want out of this corn field, right? That's all I know. I just want out. And we finally, we reach it. And as we break through the outside of the corn, I see our parents, my mom, my dad, Chris's mom and dad, they're all standing about 200 yards away yelling, Greg, Chris. At that moment, I just busted out in tears. I just started crying. I was just so excited to to see my parents. And I remember running up to them. And at that moment, I swore off cornfields from that moment on. And I've never been back in one ever since, you know? I I remember just throwing my arms and, and being reunited with my parents and just the feeling that came. It was probably within that year that I got a gift from my mom. And my mom got me this gift. And the gift that my mom got me was a compass, (laughs) a compass. And she told me something when she gave me this compass. She said, you know, Greg, as long as you have this, you'll always be able to find true north. And if you can find true north, then you can always find your way home. And I remember having this compass and thinking about it. And any time that I went somewhere, I'd, I'd, I'd want to be sure that I had a compass with me. I want to be sure that I would know north and south and east and west. And I knew that if I had a compass, then I'd be able to get where I needed to go. And it's funny because I live life today and I see lots of people who are lost in the cornfields of life, right? Now, it may not be an actual cornfield, but they're trying to figure out how to get out. They're trying to make sense of life. They're trying to figure out how to fix this thing, but they're just like me. I mean, they're, they're bruised and bleeding. I mean, their heart is pumping. They're trying to figure it out. I mean, you got people trying to figure out a marriage, a marriage that nothing seems to be working. I got people trying to figure out how to parent how to care for their kids, to be both the example, but also the leader and how to balance that in their life. I got those struggling with decisions that they're making, poor decisions that that are hurting them. And they're trying to figure out how to get out of this this field. And, And they're taking the advice of people and they're trying this thing and that thing. And they're trying to figure out in and of themselves. But I think the problem that I often see is that people are missing out on true north. People are missing out on the compass. People can't find their way out. And the beautiful thing is that God gives us a true north. God gives us the Bible. 
God gives us the Bible to give us wisdom, wisdom that we need in order to make the next steps inside of our life. I love what 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, verses 16 and 17. Here, here, here's what Paul told Timothy. He said, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And I want you to, I want to let you know that that means man of God, woman of God. We're talking about mankind so that your life, that you can be two things. The Bible's here to make you two things. The two things you're called to make is complete and equipped. Now, let me ask you, when I say the word complete, what comes to your mind? If a person is complete, whole, good, put together, good, happy, good. The word actually could be found in the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom and wholeness go hand in hand. We think of the word peace, but peace and wholeness go together that we should have peace, not only with others, but peace within ourselves. I think of someone being complete is someone who is content in and of their own skin, someone who is authentic and true and honest and likes the person that they look at in the mirror every morning. I would say that would be a complete person. Now, what about the other side, equipped? When I say the word equipped, what do you think of? Prepared, good, prepared, and stereo on both sides. That's exactly right, good. Equipped, prepared, what else? Knowledgeable, good. One more? Experienced. Experienced, good. To have the experience, the knowledge, the equipment necessary to face the many struggles and trials and issues that we're going to go through each and every single day of life. Let me tell you, you're going to face things. If you're not facing things today, I promise you, give it time. You'll be facing things before too long, all right? We're always going to be facing things. And when we face these things, God's word has the power to give us the wisdom necessary to face the things that we're going to be facing. You know, when I think about that, for me, I'm reminded of a time in my life when I was training in martial arts. I'm a big fan of, of martial arts. I, I like it. And then I like that my little kid wanted to learn karate, right? Because if he was going to learn, that gave me an excuse to learn. And so then I started going to karate with my little nine-year-old. Maybe he was about nine at the time. And so uh, we started karate. And my, my sensei was a really good sensei. He's like a world champion kind of, kind of guy. And he really likes sparring. And so we would have Friday would always be sparring sessions. And the way that he would do sparring is that there's two lines and you would spar the person and then you would move down to the next person. Then you would spar that person. Then you would move down to the next person. You would spar. And whenever, so every week, he would put himself on one line and me on the other line. And I would always, every single Friday, have the opportunity to spar my sensei, which he seemed to like a lot. <laughs> Maybe it was the fact that I wasn't a nine-year-old girl. I don't know, all right? But he really enjoyed sparring me for some reason. And I remember the first Friday, I'm ready. Like, I'm excited. I learned some stuff, right? So I'm going to spar this world champion karate guy. And I'm going up, swinging, I'm kicking, I'm doing everything I could. And then what he did, out of nowhere, he just comes up with his left hook. And he's like, Wah -tah! boom, man. Actually, I was like, boom, I went that way, right? And he hits me with his left hook out of nowhere. And then eventually my time was up. I went to the next one. You know, I'm going to get that seven-year-old kid. Ugh, I'm going to take out my aggression on him. Next Friday comes around, puts me in the line. He's on one side. I'm on the other. I come down to him. I'm ready. I know it's coming, right? I know it's coming. Out of nowhere, boom, Jew, hits me. This time, man, I start to see stars. I mean, he's really clocked me one, right? He always does it near the end of our time, too, you know, because he knows I'm about to unleash on him, and then it beep, and goes to the next one, right? Third week, come up to him. Guess what he does? 
bam, except this time it's like full force. Like I'm just, I'm knocked back. I mean, I almost, I almost fall over. And he smirked at me. And I remember looking back at him and like, man, what you smirking at? Oh, I'm paying money for this? <laughs> but then afterwards he said, hey, you want to learn how to block that left hook? <laughs> I was like, heck yeah, I want to learn how to block that left hook. And so he took me to the side and he showed me, he showed me, he's like, you come up like this and wrap and around and you bring it down. And so that entire week, man, I'm at home by myself. I'm like, I said, man, when that comes again, I'm going to get it, you know? And I was just ready and prepared. The next Friday, the fourth Friday comes along and yeah, it comes down and he's on one side and I'm on the other. And I'm just waiting, come face to face, toe to toe. I'm ready now. I've been practicing all week. So I'm ready to spar. He comes up with that left hook, man. I don't know where. I'm like a machine, man. Watch it, y'all. I pull him down just like that. It was beautiful, man. I felt so good in that moment. And then out of nowhere, he comes up with a right hook to the gut. Boom! Oh, man. <laughs> Knocked the wind straight out of me, right? Knocked the wind straight out of me. And guess what he did for the next three weeks? Boom! Yeah? Until he comes up and says, hey, you want to learn how to block that right hook? I was like, Did you, yeah, what is it, job security for you or something? <laughs> keep me coming back, keep beating me up. But you know what I learned in the midst of that moment? I learned the reality that there's always going to be different things that I have to learn in life. And some of you, you've been getting beat up by a left hook for a while. It's the same thing over and over and over, and it keeps hitting you. Think about it. I mean, what, what is it? What is that thing that you're struggling with? That it just keeps coming around. I talk to a lot of people. Maybe it's, you know, you're struggling in an area of addiction that you just continue to going back to that empty well, thinking it's going to satisfy. It doesn't. Bam. You go back. You always seem to find yourself getting angry about this thing or that. Bam. It's hitting you. You find yourself continually lying even when you don't have to lie. Bam. It's hitting you. So something's coming. You see, the Bible is that wisdom that we need in order to tackle that thing. That's, that's what it is. That's how it's training us. And the problem is, is that we're not taking the time to really address this left hook that continues to come at our lives. Think about it. Your life, where you are, what is that left hook? What is it? And when was the last time that you went to the Bible to find an answer to that left hook? I talked to some people, maybe it's anger. I'm struggling with anger. Let me tell you, the Bible has a lot to say about anger. When was the last time that you opened up scripture and you began to dive in trying to find every verse on anger and how it applies to your life? For some, it may be depression or sadness. When was the last time you opened up the scripture and got involved in it? For others, it may be lust. Lust keeps sneaking up, bam, punching you right there. Man, how am I going to deal with that thing? When was the last time you opened up scripture and began to dive into that and see what the Bible has to say? And then you begin to pull those scriptures out and you begin to pray those scriptures over your life. I think about lust. Lust comes in. You know, there's a verse, Job 31.1 says this, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Next time that, that comes up, boom, that left hook comes. You say, oh no, you didn't. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young, and, and you do it. And guess what? Then someone's going to cut you off and you're going to get gut checked with anger. Okay, now I know what I need to work on. I need to work on that. Ah, I'm getting this under control. Now I'm going to work on something else. That's life. Let me tell you, you're never going to have no punches coming at you. You're consistently going to have punches coming at you in your life, but you have to decide how you're going to live. Either you're going to continue to get knocked out or you're going to say, okay, I'm going to engage. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow. And for us, the Bible is a great teacher on how to handle these many punches that are going to come into your life. In Psalm 119, verse 105, it says this. It says, the, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's, that's not really what I want from the Bible. Because see, what, what I want is, is I want that kind of light, right? 
I want like the bus that has all the headlights in it. I want like the LED light bar kind of light. I want the kind of light that's going to allow me to see for the next five miles ahead. That's, that's what I want. I, I want to go to the Bible and open it up and then see the steps that I have to take for the next 10 years and then put it down. But see, that's not what scripture tells me the Bible is. The Bible is not a, a, a floodlight right? It's not even a mag light. In fact, scripturally, when we look at this example, it's actually more like a lantern. See, your, your word is, is more like a lantern. C can we kill these lights here for me, Sherry? Can, can you do that? Let's we'll see if this works here. There you go. That's, that's pretty good. It's like a lantern. Now, here's the interesting thing. They didn't have batteries back in Bible times, but I don't have an antique one, so this is the best you're gonna get, all right? So they got a lantern kind of like this, right? They would light it up, they would light this lantern, and the crazy thing, can you take these lights all the way down, Sherry? Because this is not having the dramatic effect I'd hoped. Okay, a little better. All right, so you're able to see if you have this lantern right here, your word is a lamp to my feet. Here's what ends up happening. It's showing you your next steps, right? Maybe your next nine, 10 steps at most. And then the interesting thing is that as you take those steps, this thing's going to continue to illuminate the next steps that you have to take. See, your word is a lamp to my feet. That's exact. That script. Now, sometimes in our life, what we want to do is we want to open the Bible and read the Bible, right? Have this moment. And then what we do is we set it right there and we just start living life. I got this. I got this. Oh, geez. And you wonder why you're tripping and falling because you left it back there. Think about that in your life. When was the last time you opened up scripture and read it? If it says the word is a lamp to your feet, maybe that's the reason the left hook keeps hitting you. Maybe that's the reason you keep falling all over yourself. Maybe that's the reason you're not making headway in your life. And you're trying all these other things, trying to fix it. Well, it must be this, it must be that. But there, you left your lamp way back there. And so now you gotta come to the place where you make the decision in your life to understand that I need this every single day with every step that I take. That it's not just a one-time thing, that this becomes part of who I am. All right, you can turn those lights back on. Now, a lamp to my feet, illuminating the next steps that I'm called to take on this earth. That's, that's what this thing does. This is what God's word does. So we want God's word to be regularly part of our journey. So we become connected on a regular basis. You know, when I think about journeys, I think oftentimes about the Israelites. And the Israelites were on a pretty long journey. Remember that time when they were in the desert, just traveling around? How long were they journeying? 40 years, right? 40 years. Now here's the crazy thing. 40 years traveling around in the desert. And if you've ever seen a map of it, they kind of like, they're just all over the place, right? All over the place. Maybe that was a lot like Wickenburg. I, I don't know. But, you know, I imagine when, when I'm out in the desert, I think of the Israelites often just traveling around. And the one thing about traveling around is, is you can only eat so much rattlesnake, right? I mean, you got, you got to have some food. And, and this was a lot of people traveling around the desert. God moved miraculously for these Israelites. What did God provide the Israelites to eat when they were traveling around the desert? Manna, manna. manna. Manna from heaven, right? The, the bread would come down from heaven. They would wake up and boom, all of it would be there. Now, there was a rule, though, that they could eat whatever they needed to eat that day to be full. But what were they not supposed to do? Save it, store it, keep it for the next day. The idea is that God would give them each and every single day exactly what they needed in order to live. It was this idea of trust, trusting God every day for what their needs were. What did the Israelites do? 
They stored it up, right? They tried, they tried. The Bible tells us about this one time that they tried in Exodus 16, verses 20 and 21. Here's what it says. It said, Moses tells them not to, but it says they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, talking about the manna, and it bred worms and stank. That's the description, right? It bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. You see this idea in scripture of God providing what you need for every day. Some of you, you look back at your life and you have some manna memories. You have some times and when you look back and God moved miraculously. Even as I say it, you're thinking about it. You're thinking about that time he rescued you. You think about that time he provided when you had nothing. That time you were praying about something and it actually came true. And, and, and you're thinking about that. In fact, you know it so well, you tell the story a lot. He said, let me tell you about the time God showed up, man. It was awesome, right? And you share this story over and over again. And you have this man of memory. The problem is, is that we're not called just to have man of memories. See, you're called to have man of moments every day as you're walking the journey of life. God wants to show up in your life every single day. He wants to move. He wants to give you these moments where you look, but for God, I wouldn't even be here, right? but for God, this would have never happened. And he illuminates these moments through his word. His word comes alive when we take his word with him through the many moments of life. And we begin to have these manna moments that we experience each and every single day. And I want you just to think about that in your life. And this is kind of what I'm going to leave you with. It's actually my, I talk about this all the time to people. And I want to just leave you with a thought. And that's simply this. It's simply the why behind the what. You know, all over this globe right now, there's probably churches telling you that you should read the Bible. <laughs> in fact, there's many maybe wagon fingers. You should read the Bible more, right? You ever been there? You ever been to that church? I've been practicing my wagon finger towards you. I, you should do this and you should do that. But the reality is, is that why? You shouldn't read the Bible so you can mark a checkbox off. You know, you reading the Bible is not going to make God love you more. <gasps> Shocker. No, you know what? God loves you the most that he's ever going to love you right now today. You reading the Bible is not going to make God ever love you more. That's not the why. The why behind the what is that reading the Bible gives you the strength that you need to get through today. It gives you the wisdom that you're going to need for the, the, the trials, the left hooks that you're going to face today. Today, the Bible is going to give you that wisdom. The Holy Spirit wants to work through the scripture that's going to come into your life to give you the wisdom you need to live, live the best life that you possibly could for God. That's it. The why behind the what? Why do I get up in the morning and open my scripture? Why do I get up in the morning and read the Bible? I get up in the morning and read the Bible because that's my connection with God. God wants to pour into my life. He wants to give me the wisdom necessary to live the life. And that's going to come through his living word, his word that is alive, living, and active. He's going to speak to me and encourage me and strengthen me and give me exactly what I need. See, in your life, I want to encourage you to do that. And I know that for many of us, maybe it's been a long time. And so here's what we're going to do as a church. I want to encourage you on your cell phone to download a certain app. The app is simply called the Bible app. Ever heard of it? Many of you probably already have it, right? But if you're looking at me funny and was like, well, how on earth would I do such a thing? Let me take 45 seconds and show you how. Check this out. So the first thing that we're going to do is if you have Android, you're going to go to your Android Google Play Store and you're going to type in the search Bible. Generally, you're going to see a picture just like this Bible that you see here on the screen. One of the things that you want to take note of is that it says Bible life church.tv 
The next thing that you're going to do is click install. Once you do that, that's all you have to do to download it to your Android device. Same thing on the iPhone. The picture is exactly the same. You want to make sure that it says Bible Life Church TV. Currently on mine, it says open. That's because I currently have that app on my phone. However, if you don't have it on your device, it's going to say install. Simply click the button that says install. It'll be in the same location. And so then on your phone, you're going to have the Bible. The Bible is going to be with you wherever you go. You're going to be able to open it and read it. And then this week, what we're going to do as a church body is that we're going to start a study on the Bible app together. It's really simple. In fact, if you'd like to get involved with that, inside of your bulletin was a connection card, and there's a little uh, box at the bottom that says, I would like to start the Bible study this week. All you gotta do is check that, make sure your email is marked on that connection card. On Monday, we're gonna add you, and we're gonna start this study together as a church on the Sermon on the Mount, on Tuesday. And so it's a 10 day study that we can go through collectively together. Now, why are we doing this? Because we want to practice what we preach. Amen. We want to communicate together as a church body. We want to try something new and do something a little different. And I want to encourage you to get in your, in your Bible. So what will happen once a day, you'll have a little thing on, inside of your Bible app. You'll get in there. You'll read your devotional for the day. You'll read a couple of scriptures. If you want to put any notes in there, you'll put it, And then you'll click check mark. And collectively together, we can help hold each other accountable. When you see the different people that are doing it, you can do it too. Say amen if you think that's something you'd like to do. Amen. All right, so that, what I need you to do on that connection card, check the box and make sure your email is right on there. And this week together, that we're going to start living life in such a way where we're going to take this lantern. The Bible is a lamp to our feet and we're going to illuminate it together. And we're going to start walking and we're going to start talking and we're going to start communicating about God's goodness with each other. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Go ahead and bow your heads. God, thanks. Thanks for today. Thanks for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. And I know every now and then, Lord, we're just reminded of truths that rest inside of our soul, truths that rest inside of our life. Yes, we know that your love for us is great. We know that you want to give us wisdom, but a lot of times we just don't know how to get it. This week, I, I pray that you encourage us. I pray that there's a, a fire in our soul, Lord God, to, to pursue you through scripture, to walk life with the other people inside of this faith community, to live the life that you've called us to live. And and maybe even when you hear this and, and you're hearing about illumination of life and seeing these next steps, you know, the reality is when Jesus was here, he was called the light of the world. Light that stepped into the midst of darkness to illuminate the path for each and every single one of us. And maybe you're here today and you're hearing that reality. And you're saying to yourself, I desperately need this light to illuminate the darkness of my life. I, I want this light to show me the steps, the next steps that I'm called to take. And it's really simple. If you're in a place where you want to ask Jesus into your life, that you're ready to surrender all and say, light of the world, come into the darkness of my life. Illuminate my heart. Illuminate my life. I want to say a prayer with you. Just right where you are. You don't have to come to the front. Right where you are. If, you're, if you would say, yes, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. Yes, Jesus, I want you to illuminate my heart. I want you to illuminate my future. I want to say a prayer with you. So if that's you, on the count of three, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to lift your hand up high so I can see it. I'm going to say a prayer with you right where you are. So if you're ready to say, yes, Jesus, light of the world, illuminate my life. On the count of three, ready? I want you to just lift your hand up high. Ready? One, two, three. Lift your hand up high so I can see it. I see you. I see you. I see you in the back. Is there anyone else that says, yes, yes, I see you. I see you right there, brother. Let's, we're going to pray. 
all those that lifted your hands, I want you to pray this loud enough to hear yourself. If you're already a follower of Christ, I want you to pray this prayer with those that are praying it for the first time. Say these words. Say, say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin, for my mess, for my mistakes. Today, I turn to you. I believe in you. I believe that you lived, you died, and you rose again, and that you have a plan for my life. Help me see me through your eyes. I give you everything. It's all yours. Take my life. Take my todays. Take my tomorrows. It's all yours. Now let me pray for you. Father, I pray for each and every single person that prayed that prayer today. Jesus, I pray that you fill them with love and peace and grace. I pray that you let them know that they are forgiven. I pray that you let them know, Lord, that your plans are perfect. I pray, Father, that you let them know that they'll never be alone again, that you're always with them, that you'll never leave them, never forsake them, that the plans that you have for them are perfect. And I pray that they live each and every single day with a smile on their face, not because of the externals that they have, but because of the work that you've done inside of their lives for the radical light that you have shined in the darkness of their hearts. God, thank you so much for your redeeming work today. I pray that in Jesus' name. Everyone says, amen. amen. We give it up for all those that prayed that prayer today. Hallelujah.